Well, that's the real challenge with all this kind of gift card and reward system fraud is that the companies don't want their customers to be victims of fraud. But on the other hand, there's diminishing returns in them really chasing it down. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and the criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, my conversation with Brandon Hoffman. He's from Intel 471, and we're going to be discussing cyber criminals going after large retail and hospitality companies. So who's got the advantage in cybersecurity, the attacker or the defender? Intelligent people differ on this, but the conventional wisdom is that the advantage goes to the attacker. But why is this? Stay with us and we'll have some insights from our sponsor, Know Before, that put it into perspective. All right, Joe, uh, why don't you start things off for us this week? What do you have for us? Dave, it's it's that time of year again. Uh, Time for (laughs) kids to go back to school. Ah, yes. All right. Well, this is particularly interesting for you as someone who spends uh, much of his time on a college campus. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Uh, In fact, I'm back in the office now, and it's it's nice. I spent most of this week on a college campus. Okay. Beautiful college campuses, one of my favorite places to be. Yeah. Uh, But the Better Business Bureau is out with an article warning – people about back-to-school scams. Oh. So there are a number of things to look out for. And, of course, everybody knows that it's back-to-school time, including the scammers, so they're going to capitalize on it. <laughs> right, okay. These guys don't, don't, uh, don't take a day off, really. Yeah. Uh, and they don't miss an opportunity or a trick. So the Better Business Bureau has a number of things to be on the lookout for. Uh, one of them is fake credit card scams. Mm. These might be calls that come in that uh, might be from a credit card you have, uh, and they're offering some astronomically low rate, and it's really just a, an opportunity to try to either steal your personal information or get access to your credit card information. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't fall for that. D- remember, don't trust inbound calls. Uh, if you get a call from somebody who says that they're from your credit card company, tell them that you'll call them right back. Yeah. Um, unless they're asking, like, this is fraud prevention, was that you? Then you can say yes or no. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, other than that, I would say don't answer any inbound inbound calls from somebody claiming to be from a credit card company. I, I'm just sort of laughing a little bit here because I remember back when I was in college, you know, back in the Stone Age, that right. uh, a lot of folks who my, – my contemporaries at school got in trouble with credit cards because, you know, when you would go buy your books at the bookstore in that bag, they'd put – a credit card application. Or, yeah, you know, there'd yeah. be people outside the student union who had a little table set up, you know, and they'd give you a free something, like a free towel or a free, some free knickknack. Well, I knew a guy in college named Co Jerrigan, and uh, somebody was from a, fr- a fraternity <laughs> or a sorority was was offering credit cards <laughs> yeah. applications, and, and yeah. this dummy signed up for one. And poor Co, man, he got oh, into a lot of trouble man. with that because he was a college student. <laughs> right, exactly. And exactly. he didn't have... Um, he didn't have he didn't have a lot of income, so he just wound up having to pay a lot of interest in credit cards. Yeah, that's a. I mean, even the real credit cards are actually a scam for college kids, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't get a credit card if you don't have any income. Right, it's right. terrible. All right. Well, what else does the BBB BBB have to say here? Right. They uh, look out for apartments that are too good to be true. Right. For the we've talked about these kind of scams as well. Oh yeah. On uh, you know you're going to a new college, maybe you're going to decide right away you're going to live off campus in an apartment because maybe it's cheaper than living in the dorm. Right. Um, I don't know that that's the case, but you're opening yourself up to exploitation from fake ads, fake like Craigslist ads or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. My advice here is is contact a realtor in the area if you're really looking to uh, to to rent an apartment. Realtors your best bet. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. The realtors have access to bona fide systems that, uh, you know, and they ha- they know the area as well, so right. they can they can really help you out. So right. use a realtor. Yeah. Uh, scholarship and grant scams. Uh, these are these are scams where people say, hey, uh, you can apply for full scholarship, right? But uh, there's an application fee, oh. and then of course you don't get the scholarship. Sorry, oh, you see. don't qualify. Oh, interesting. It's a uh, it's a great way to take advantage of people who are looking to lower their college costs. And, of course, these guys are not going to miss that, uh, that opportunity as well. Hmm. And finally, uh, they're saying be aware of online shopping scams. Hmm. Uh, you know, go, go to trust, trusted websites. Don't, uh, if something's too good to be true, it probably is. So don't fall for it. 
Uh, other advice they have is, is be aware of current scams. The BBB has a, uh, a site that's called the Scam Tracker, which, which hmm. is a great, a great site. Also, you can listen to this show. We tend to update you on scams like this on a regular basis. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, and they say uh, monitor your cred- credit report. Make sure that you have some kind of credit report monitoring software out there or mm-hmm. system, rather, mm-hmm. that you can see when somebody opens a new account. And then you can immediately stop that, nip it in the bud, and uh, – save yourself a little bit of a headache. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I think of so many uh, you know, uh, young adults who are headed off away from home for the first time, sometimes headed off to the big city or the big college campus. And, you know, it's their first time maybe not being under their parents' wing, the first time having a whole lot of independence. And because they are old enough to have adult status, right? you know, they can get their own credit cards. They right. can sign up for these sorts of things. And uh, it's hard to have that discipline when somebody's dangling, yeah, whatever money that is, you know, and you can you can uh, do do the things you want to do now and not have to wait, right? Uh, so yeah, you, need, you just need to be careful. So yeah, the uh, the BBB says according to their latest uh, scam tracker risk reports, adults age eighteen to twenty four reported the highest median median loss of one hundred fifty dollars. Hmm. Um, and lots of scams take place online. We've talked about this as well that they're um, they're more susceptible to Fall to a fall victim to a scam, uh, and 150 bucks is actually kind of low. I think. I think when older people do fall for scams, they. Uh, I find this this article interesting in that with that statistic. I think yeah. that's. Uh, I think there might be more literature out there that says differently. I wonder how if any of this is because that generation are so much more uh, comfortable and quicker with sending money around using. The online services, right, the Venmo's, like the, Venmo. yeah, all those sorts of things, you know, Apple Pay, all those sorts of things. So whereas you and I may think twice uh, at a request to send money that way right. just because, you know, it's farther <laughs> – it's it's not part of our core – we didn't grow up with that. No, right? we did it's, not. It's not reflexive to us. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, someone in that younger generation might say, well, sure, this is how you – know, that's not an unusual ask at all. It's, I send money around to my friends and family and all sorts of things that way. So for someone else to request it that way doesn't raise any red flags and maybe yeah. it should. I don't even have accounts on these things. Uh, mm-hmm. I do have a PayPal account, but I don't keep the app on my phone. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm just not comfortable paying your fees, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I mean, it's my kids who have pulled me into this. You know, my right. my son will go to – one of my sons will go to, you know, uh, like a, a gaming night at the comic book store and he'll say, oh, dad, can you send me some money? And I'll – I just pull out my phone and I send him some money. And huh. then he has money that he can spend and, you know, I, I, I it's great because it's secure and – it's easy, and but if it were not for him, I'd, I'd probably be a lot farther behind than I am. So <laughs> right. you'd you know. probably be in old Joe's shoes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I have reached the point where sometimes, like if I'm trying to, like, I'll just throw my kid the remote. <laughs> I'm like, right. just fix, <laughs> fix this. Fix this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and that's yeah. I'm not proud of that, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, we used to be the guys that fixed everything by touching it. Remember I that, know, Dave? I know, just laying our hands upon it, and people would look at us like we were magical wizards. So. <laughs> Those days are long behind us. That. Now we just sit back and stroke our beards and <laughs> right. tell stories about the old days. Well, <laughs> speaking of stories about the old days, my story this week is a story about the old days. Is it really? It is. And it is a, uh, it's a good social engineering story. I was actually sharing this story with a friend of mine earlier this week, and my friend said, you know what? You should share that on Hacking Humans. That's a great social engineering story. And I thought, hmm. you know what? I think you're right. So cool. <laughs> this is what I call the tale of the lightning rod edit. Hmm. Now, when I first got out of college, and I graduated college as an RTVF major, which is radio, television, and film. So I came out of school, and I was looking for work uh, doing uh, production, video production, film production, those sorts of things. And um, I got a bunch of work from a guy who was local to me who had a small video production company. And so he did a lot of corporate work. He did a lot of government work. And he would hire me to help him go out on shoots and help him do edits and all those sorts of things. And I was very excited to work for him and I was learning everything. This is back in the days before everything was computerized. So we were still doing edits with multiple tape decks and you know, the decks were controlled by computers, but you weren't digitizing everything and just doing everything on the computers, right? right? 
So because of that, editing was uh, much more of a, a long process. You, you didn't have the flexibility. It was, it was, I guess the best way to say it, it was more like using a typewriter than using a word processor. Right. Right. So um, part of the process when you're making a video, and these are in the days of like 20-minute long corporate videos, right, pre-YouTube. So things were much more long form back then. So you'd be making your video, you'd be working, let's say, with the marketing people at a company, and there would come a point when the video was just about done, and it was time to show it to the powers that be, time to show it to the, the suits, right? <laughs> All of the stakeholders, the people who were writing the checks for this sort of thing. And so this guy I was working with, uh, before we were, he was, he was going to take me into this meeting so I could experience what this meeting was was like. Was this a new experience for you? Uh, I, I don't know that I had been in this sort of room before. Okay. And, uh, and, and so he was kind enough to include me so I could have, I could learn what that was like. Right. You know? And so. Come on in, keep your mouth shut and watch what goes on. Right. So before we went, we did the, the final sort of viewing of the video ourselves to make sure everything was okay. And, um. Are watching through, and I and I said uh, to this guy, I said, "Whoa, wait a minute! Uh, are you sure about that? That edit there? That's kind of clunky." He was like, "Yeah, just leave it in." I said, "Why?" He said, "You'll see." <laughs> I, I think said, I know where this is going. I said, "Okay." So we go into this big, you know, boardroom with uh, a fine, big wooden table and wood walls, and you know, people who are very well dressed, and and we've you know dressed up for ourselves. We're not using wearing our usual. You know, dirty T-shirts and stained shorts. You know, right? <laughs> we, 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 as, as the stuff film you actually edited the guys. video in. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, clean up well. So we go in and we're showing the video, and the time comes for this. This edit comes, and one of the bosses says, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on! Stop, 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 stop!" And uh, the guy I'm working with says, "Yes." He says, "Wait, back that up. I want to see that again." So we rewind it and plays, and they come to this this awkward edit. And the guy says, what? It's, that doesn't seem right to me. And the guy I'm working with says, oh, my gosh, you're right. Wow, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I'm, I, I'm so glad you caught that. How could we have missed that? Uh, really happy for your contributions. And we go on and, and, you know, some more conversation. They show the rest of the video. It all goes pretty well. You know, a couple notes, a couple changes, things here and there. And. And afterwards, we're driving back to uh, to my friend's studio, and I'm like, "So, what exactly happened?" And he says to me, "Dave, that was the lightning rod edit." The lightning rod edit. I got I it. Said, I said, "What do you mean the lightning rod edit?" He said, "Here's what I've learned." He said, "When it comes time to do a presentation like this, there are going to be people in the room who, for whatever reason, feel the need to justify their existence." Right? Right. They can't just sit back and say nothing because for whatever reason, maybe they have imposter syndrome, maybe who knows, but they right. feel as though if they don't say something, their colleagues are going to wonder why they're even in the room. Right. So the lightning rod edit gives them a reason to comment. <laughs> it's the lightning rod. Right. <laughs> right. It's the obviously bad thing that we leave in the video to give those people something to say. And that keeps them from finding other things to, to comment on that probably don't warrant being commented on. Right. And I said to myself, wow. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I had mixed feelings about it because, you know, it's, it is certainly, uh, it's a little bit manipulative, right? right. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I would say it's unethical because it it would have gotten fixed anyway. There was right. no way the video was going to go out with this awkward edit in it. Now, right? here's my question. Yeah. Does, are there people in the room that you're showing the video to who understand what you're doing and are fine with it, right? Like, are you showing it to somebody who goes, who who says, I know that you're not going to leave that, that, that edit in there. It's terrible. You're not putting out a garbage product because I, I've, I've been doing business with you for a while. Um, Yes. It, mm -hmm. And and I'm okay with you leaving this in there so that somebody else can can say something about it. No, I don't I so I don't think I don't think other people are in on the, the I mean they're not in on it explicitly, but 
Do they understand what you're doing? I th- no, I think they perceive it as being just an honest mistake. Okay. An, like an oops. Okay. Oh, of course. Well, of course we're not going to leave that in. You know, that's it's it's the same as having a uh, I don't know, someone's name misspelled in their, you know, in their lower third and when you're IDing someone or you right. know, it's just it's a typo. It's it's that sort of thing. Um, but in this case, it was it was deliberate. And this person I was working with used it as a regular sort of business technique that he seemed to believe saved him time and money and, um, you know, made everybody feel good that they were contributors, but kept him from having to... It, what it did was it, it saved a lot of um, back and forth and sort of arguing in the room right. over things that people believed were good. Yes. Right. It, it was. It's a misdirection. Yeah. Right? It is. <laughs> it's a I get it. I get what he's yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to know if he ever uh, tracked how well things went for him when he didn't put the lightning rod edit in. Yeah, I don't if, know if how much time he had to spend on the on the. That would be the good measurement, right? Because you can quantify this. Yeah. If I had the lightning rod edit in, how much time do I have to spend on re-editing after the meeting versus if I? Don't have if I don't have the lightning rod edit. Yeah, and it could have. I mean, it, this very well could have been. This could have completely been a placebo, mm-hmm. right? Like he could believe that it made a difference and it didn't. Right. But it it did no harm. Yep. And I think once he tried it and it seemed to work, it was a technique he was going to stick with. I I say I did not when uh, later on you know I formed my own company and all that sort of stuff and was doing this su- t- type of work for quite a while. I this was not something I adopted uh for myself okay. as a technique, but uh but I always thought it was interesting and it was effective and so uh, just a fun little bit of social engineering I thought I'd share. That's 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 a great story. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Yeah, he, he was a he was a good guy. He was a good guy, and this was you know this was not coming. I mean, I think the bottom what what makes me feel okay about this is that I truly believe he was coming at this from the point of view of just sort of saving everyone some heartache. Right. You know, it gave the complainers something to complain about. Right. While right. not having them complain about stuff that didn't deserve to be complained right. about. Right. I get it. Right? I, I think that's I think that's a great idea. I right. don't know. Right. I don't know how I feel about. It. I have to think about this one for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'll, believe me, I've thought about it a lot, and uh, I, I guess I'm at peace with it. Right. So, All right. Well, that is my story this week. It is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from a listener named Shannon, who writes, Hi, guys. I love your podcast. Thank you, Shannon. I found this email in my spam today. Before I even finished reading it, I knew I had to send it to you. So, Dave, why don't you read who this email is from? It's from a very important person we've been talking a lot about. On this <laughs> That's right. Recently. It says, attention beneficiary. Attention. My name is Janet Louise Yellen, an American economist who's serving as the 78th and current United States Secretary of the Treasury as part of the cabinet of Joe Biden. Previously, I was the 15th chair of the Federal Reserve from 2014 to 2018. I was the first woman to hold either role. Previously on my Twitter account, where I gave a hint of this program on January 29th, I tweeted, we need to act big and act now to help people make it to the other side of the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan has small business in mind. I enjoyed discussing it with a panel of small business owners from across the country yesterday. This is what we are talking about, even though these transactions are meant to be confidential. However, at the International Financial Organization annual meeting in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, which convened world leaders to discuss the global, regional, and industry agendas in the middle of each year, it was agreed, among other things, and with the global financial integrity, that making growth sustainable, making growth inclusive, and harnessing technology for good is a priority and must be tackled without delay. The amount which was awarded to you is U.S. $2.5 million. Speaking with the United Nations Association of the USA, UNA USA, and with the Council of Europe, adding the Asian Parliamentary Assembly and all are in support of the payoff of beneficiaries from countries in Europe who are guided by the European Union organization, also USA, South America, Middle East, Africa, and Asia, through online banking system in order to avoid the huge payment of tax in your country. Therefore, the EU Parliament, which is headquartered in Strasbourg, France, and has its administrative offices in Luxembourg City, initiated the electronic random pick. And through this electronic random pick, your email was chosen for the implementation (laughs) of making sustainable growth and harnessing technology for good. 
funds have been mapped out for those picked in the process. This disbursement will be monitored by the Global Financial Integrity, the representative you are therefore advised to contact, Ms. Jan Schakowsky, who will monitor the release of your funds. Best regards, Janet Louise Yellen. <laughs> I love this email, Dave. Wow. It's it's like it's like there's at these at these monetary meetings, there's this big wheel. They spin it. Oh, Joe Kerrigan. Two point five million dollars. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I love that it's it's always <laughs> Janet Louise Yellen. I didn't know Janet Yellen's middle name was Louise. I actually verified that by looking it up on Wikipedia. Okay. Uh, and it is Janet Louise Yellen. All but right. I, I don't know why that's included in here. I think it's interesting <laughs> that it is. Right, right. Yes. So I think there's some interesting things in here that they pulled – a, a, a actual legitimate tweet of hers. Right. So if you wanted to sort of fact check this, right. she did tweet what they said she tweeted. So that's real. Right. Uh, but the rest of it is not. No. <laughs> $2.5 billion uh, because we spun the big prize wheel and right. your email address came Randomly up. selected your email. Right. That's right. not how international financial policy works. No, no, no. <laughs> and the, the United Nations decided that instead of, uh, I don't know, vaccinating children in Africa, we're just right. going to give you $2.5 million. <laughs> go, go, go crazy. Go have fun with it. Go t- it's going to be technology for good. This totally makes sense. Yeah, on the world stage. <sighs> All right. Well, that was a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> uh, we would love to hear from you. If you have a catch of the day for us or a story you'd like us to cover, you can send us a note to hackinghumans at the cyberwire.com. Now let's return to our sponsor's question about the attacker's advantage. Why do the experts think this is so? It's not like a military operation where the defender is thought to have most of the advantages. In cyberspace, the attacker can just keep trying and probing at low risk and low cost, and the attacker only has to be successful once. And as No Before points out, email filters designed to keep malicious spam out have a failure rate of over 10%. That sounds pretty good. Who wouldn't want to bat nearly 900? But this isn't baseball. If your technical defenses fail in one out of 10 tries... You're out of luck and maybe out of business. The last line of defense is your human firewall. You can test that firewall with Nobefore's free phishing test, which you can order up at nobefore.com slash fish test. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash fish test. Hi, Joe. I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Brandon Hoffman. He is from a company called Intel 471. And we're focusing on how cyber criminals have been going after large retail and hospitality companies. Here's my conversation with Brandon Hoffman. The gift card situation is, is, has been around for quite some time. It's almost as a secondary cash out method, uh, as it were, because monetizing things like reward accounts, you know, are quite difficult, as you can imagine. So if you think, uh, if you had access to somebody's frequent flyer account, uh, certainly you wouldn't just, if you were a cyber criminal, you can't just simply issue a ticket for the person who bought the stolen uh, stolen miles, right? Because right, that would right. obviously make it quite easy to track. And right. so uh, instead of simply monetizing them the way they would other pieces of information, uh, they found that gift cards is a secondary cash out method which makes it less traceable. And actually, the interesting thing about gift cards is that there doesn't seem to be as much of an effort from fraud teams around gift cards and rewards miles. And I know you didn't necessarily intend to link rewards accounts to it, but they are kind of related in, in the sense that yeah. they're not treated the same as actual you know, stolen money or stolen data, even though to many of us who have... Uh, lots of reward points or airline miles or things like that. To us, they're pretty much the same as cash to a degree. And and I suppose, I mean, or or I guess, is it fair to speculate that uh, for a lot of these companies, because so many gift cards go unused that I suspect it's a, it's a, it's an area of high profit for them. Um, So maybe that's a reason why they don't keep a, a, such a close eye on it. They're not losing money there. 
Yeah, interest, it's, it is interesting because it's kind of like they've already received the money, the, mm. the organization, right? And so as long as it gets used, uh, because at least here in the U.S., uh, gift cards no longer have expiration. They, they legally can't expire, right? They, they used right. to expire, as you probably recall, uh, and in parts of the world, maybe they can. But from, an, from a pure accounting perspective, you know, you, they've already collected the revenue. They just need to be able to recognize the revenue, which means the gift card needs to be used. So to a varying degree, I don't want to say they don't care because they do. Uh, it needs to be used from a business perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they can recognize that revenue. Now, of course, b- big companies that have gift cards programs, right? They, they do track this from a fraud perspective and, and they, do, they do care, right? Uh, but it's, it's less intense than, you know, people who are stealing actual money or, or, or intellectual property. And, and you all were tracking some, some folks who were selling uh, these rewards programs, selling the points and, and access to them online. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Correct. What's the mechanism there? Uh, how, how are they going about doing that? Well, so there's, you know, it, it, typical with the cybercrime marketplaces, you know, it's, there's two stages. One is, hey, I have access to reward accounts. I don't want to cash it out or monetize it. I'd rather just sell this access to somebody who can do something with these rewards. Hmm. Um, that's the first most basic step. The second is uh, somebody who has the access and has turned them into uh, something, some other financial instrument like a gift card. And then they'll sell that gift card for a portion of the value. So it's kind of like a derivative of a derivative, you know, as it goes downstream. Um, that's, you know, that's pretty common with uh, how we see uh, cybercrime functioning, right? There's, there's, there's people who sell products, goods, and services, and some people want to do the full chain of monetization. And some people just want to do the little piece that they're good at and move on. Another area that you all looked into here was um, video games. Why, why are the, the criminals attracted to them? It's an interesting thing with the video games. Um, I think it's, it's because video games are, you know, really at the center of a lot of, you know, young culture. There's a lot of people who they spend a lot of their leisure time uh, in video games. And a lot of people spend a real lot of money with the video games that they like. And so people are always looking for ways to advance their gaming mechanisms or to get more credits in their gaming systems. And I think uh, maybe, if, I don't want to say it's just younger folks, but I think people are looking for ways to, just like anything else, kind of get a deal, as it were, on mm-hmm. you know video game credits or um, things like that. And so uh, I think that the, the cyber criminals know that there's a, you know, there's a popular following. Lots of people spend a lot of money on video games, and and that's just another way for them to uh, to monetize this. And I think probably when we talked just a moment ago about who's really tracking these things, I, you know, I don't know that uh, I want to go out and say for sure that there's even less of an eye on it uh, there. But I feel, you know, I have a feeling that it's less tracked specifically in video game setups. Uh, You know, think, for example, Amazon, right? Uh, Certainly their fraud team is spending a lot of time looking at gift card abuse. But some of these video game providers, you know, they're just, they're like like we talked about earlier, they're bringing in the money. They don't care how it's used. And probably there's less of an eye on it because there's, I, I just, you know, I don't know how to say that. There's I want to say well, that they, I mean, it's, it strikes yeah. me that that every dollar that because they're getting the money ahead of time, every dollar they spend on fraud prevention goes against that money that they've already collected. So yeah, there's well, sort of the a, a yeah, right. There's a there's a funny uh, incentive there. Well, that's the real challenge with all this kind of gift card and reward system fraud is that the companies don't want their customers to be victims of fraud. They don't want their systems to be abused for fraudulent purposes. But on the other hand, there's diminishing returns in them really chasing it down. So they put preventative mechanisms in it, but it's not the same thing that like financial services is going to do where people are stealing whole bank accounts, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now what about ransomware? I mean, obviously lots of stories about ransomware in the news um, and retail organizations have that on their radar as well. 
Yeah, I mean, ransomware, yeah, big, big right now. Um, no victims are excluded. No potential victims are excluded. Ransom uh, retail, of course, plenty of plenty of big ransomware events to point to uh, mm. when we look at ransomware. You know, retail, yeah, not excluded there. I think it's interesting too um, because with retail, there's so much more that a ransomware group can do aside from you know the obvious, which is crippling the retail system, preventing e-commerce from taking place. That has a significant revenue impact. But then there's, you know, more recently this emergence of focus on the data exfiltration uh, as opposed to the encryption as a lot of ransomware uh, as a service providers and ransomware groups have talked about that some of them were shying away from doing the encryption and rather just focusing on the data exfiltration and using that as leverage enough to get paid because the retail organizations have such rich information. They have personal identifiable information of their consumers and their customers, they have payment card information, uh, and then also you can cripple them, preventing e-commerce from taking place, right? So there's you can really hit them three different ways that are meaningful, uh, and I think that makes them a little bit more of a juicier target to a degree. Hmm. What can people do to protect their own interests here? I mean, the, for the folks who uh, actively collect their frequent flyer miles or their hotel rewards points, or, are there things that, that you all recommend to, to sort of best practices to, to uh, you know, not be the low-hanging fruit? Yeah, I mean, the majority of these compromises, I mean, if, if, if the organization itself is compromised, you know, like your airline or a retail organization, right, of course, there's limited things you can do because they're going to take the data from the back end. But mm. as a consumer, um, a lot, you know, a lot of this does happen through compromised credentials. So them planting malware, phishing attacks against consumers that can, you know, they can collect the username and password for these accounts, which is you know, that that happens, the majority of these cases are from compromised credentials. And so as a consumer, the best thing you can do, of course, as we've said for a long time, rotate your password frequently. That has limited value, but it has value. Uh, Of course, taking advantage of any two-factor authentication that a provider or anywhere you log in, you know, if if they offer two-factor authentication or multi-factor, definitely take advantage of that. Uh, Mm -hmm. Beware of you know, emails and phishing, just like always, you know, if you're going to click on something from, you know, somebody that you do e-commerce business with, you know, verify that that email did come from them. Um, And then the other thing is browser sanitization. You know, however you browse the internet on your computer, just make sure that it's always up to date, you know, run antivirus or anti-malware to make sure that some of those credential stealing uh, or info stealing malwares, you know, are not loaded uh, in your system. All right, Joe, what do you think? Dave, I think it's interesting that the bad guys are focusing on specific industries, mm-hmm. right? I don't, I'd like to know if this is the case. Are there people who are essentially like experts at exploiting the travel industry? Hmm. I, I, would, I would not be surprised to find that they are. Why, I bet they are, yeah. Why wouldn't there be people who are just, I, you know, like people who just say, I exploit hotel chains. I exploit airlines. Mm-hmm. And, and that's all I do because there's plenty of opportunity to do this. Right. One of the things that Brandon says is that compromised credentials are the biggest or soon to be the biggest vector that he's seeing. Those credentials are compromised via some social engineering attack, yeah. via phishing or calling the phone on the phone and asking for it. Uh, and the compromised credential threat model has a pretty long kill chain, if you will. Hmm. Uh, they use the, the kill chain as a jargon term. It just means an opportunity, uh, you know, a list of opportunities to stop the attack. Okay. Right? So if you can stop the phishing email, you can stop the attack. If you can stop the uh, block the phishing site, you know, where the, where the people enter their credentials, you've stopped the attack. If right. you can use a hardware-based multi-factor authentication, you can pretty much stop the attack. Yep. And if you can stop a strange login from an unusual point of origin, like a VPN or, or another country, uh, you can stop the attack. Mm, mm-hmm. So there are lots of opportunities to stop the attack, but they, they still keep happening, yeah, right? Yeah. The footprint is large for the travel industry. Uh, and, and there are a lot of industries that are like this. You think of the customer-facing websites, think of an airline and the, and the systems that they have mm-hmm. that people have to use to book flights. 
you know, I, I fly uh, a lot on an airline that doesn't have assigned seating, but on airlines that do have assigned seating, those that has a lot of overhead as, uh, associated with it. The the system behind it has to be more complex, right? Sure. And and the the larger that footprint, the bigger the uh, attack surface, and and that's mm. what. It's interesting that there are a lot of ways for people to make money exploiting this industry. And Brandon makes a great uh, point about gift cards. They're a great, great way to launder money uh, and steal affinity points and rewards. Yeah. In terms of laundering money, it doesn't make the money look legitimate, right? Because if you, you know, if you have a billion or a million dollars in gift cards that you've received, that's not going to look legitimate. But <laughs> right, it does make the money really easy to move around. Yeah. Um, and you can quickly turn these things into cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. uh, just on on lots of open markets out there. It's 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 readily available for anybody to do that. Yeah, yeah. And the the it's it's hard to trace and it's easy to to spend that money because it's in the organizations whose gift card you have. It's in their interest to make that transaction as frictionless as possible. Right. right? They're and, not going to ask a lot of questions. Right, because right. they have the money in escrow actually. Right, right. Uh, they already have the money, right? Right, but right. It's, but they can't actually count it as a as revenue since it's an escrow, they really can't uh use it until you until you spend it. So it, it is in their interest and they have to maintain the escrow as well. That has an expense associated with it. Right. So right. the sooner you get it uh you get it out of escrow, the the better off you are. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, again, our thanks to Brandon Hoffman from Intel 471 for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Of course, we want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Coach Jerrigan. <laughs> Thanks for listening.